Hi, I'm Tom Payton, Director and Publisher at Trinity University Press. Thanks for joining us today as we talk about the new book, The Last Speaker of Bear by Lawrence Millman. As a nonprofit, cultural and educational publisher, we are committed to an evolving agenda of work that engages, questions and brings us together productively in person and online to discuss the natural physical world around us and how it shapes us individually and as communities. To those ends, we hope you find some substance and enlightenment, if not entertainment, in the discussion. The Last Speaker of Bear is a patchwork story of a life spent traveling in the far north from Alaska to Siberia. Lawrence Millman first visited, north, first visited Northern Canada as a child and has spent four decades since on some 35 expeditions in search of undeveloped landscapes and traditional cultures, not to mention untamed wildlife. While much of his experience is centered in Canada, including territories from Yukon to Quebec and Newfoundland, and Newfoundland Labrador, he includes stories from villages in Greenland, Iceland, and Norway as well. In this collection of vignettes, Lawrence reminds us of the potency of endangered knowledge, as well as the importance of paying very close attention to the natural world and what it is trying to tell us or remind us. He opens our eyes to life in remote places thousands of miles from the fast-paced urban worlds so many of us inhabit. Joining Lawrence in this conversation is writer Ryan Murdoch. Ryan is the author of Vagabond Dreams, Road Wisdom from Central America. He's an editor-at-large for Outpost, Canada's largest national travel magazine, a weekly columnist for The Shift, and writes for other publications as well. His work has taken him across a remote stretch of Canada's Northwest Territories on foot, as well as into the Central Sahara in search of prehistoric rock art. He's a fellow at the Royal Geographic Society. And when he's not on the road, he hosts a personal landscapes podcast where he talks with writers and publishers about great books that define us and describe the importance of place in our lives. You can order the new book, The Last Speaker of Bear at tupress.org using the link in the chat screen and get a 20% discount if you use the promo code LSB, last speaker of bear, LSB20 at checkout. And now please welcome Ryan and Lawrence. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to everyone at Trinity University Press. And thank you to all of you out there listening. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please pop it into the Q&A. You'll see a box at the bottom of your screen if you're on Zoom. <laughs> And now to our guest of honor. Lawrence Millman is the only person I've ever met who hates pumpkin pie, but likes to eat bird droppings. Larry, you had one of the best leads of, in a, I've ever read in a magazine piece. You wrote that when someone tells you to, when, when you tell someone to eat shit, it's not exactly a compliment. And then of course you proceeded to do so. That story is included in the new book in a slightly different form. And I think it's a great place to open this discussion since I promised my own subscribers that I'd get the recipe from you. So you might want to start by explaining why you would do such a thing. Well, it's it's really a very interesting story. Um, uh, ptarmigans are a northern bird. Um, and they're eaten, the droppings or the shit or the fecal matter is eaten in Greenland in the winter because it's soggy and gooey at other times of year. And in the winter, they will eat birch catkins and willow catkins. So their droppings tend to have a, a harder, a more, shall we say, um, less nauseating quality than if one were to scoop up the goo. And I had this several times in Greenland, but it was cooked in rancid seal oil. And the rancid seal oil disguised the flavor of the ptarmigan shit. And I desperately wanted to find out what ptarmigan shit tasted like. So there I was in Iceland with a friend of mine who Ryan knows as well, Lena. Um, and I got some ptarmigan shit from a friend who was a mycologist with one of my hats. I am a mycologist. She was going to culture it and find out uh, what fungi grew in ptarmigan shit, but she very kindly gave me a batch. And Lena and I cooked it in a uh, 
uh, sheep uh, fat, not rancid, mind you, not rancid. Uh, uh, we cooked it in sheep fat and uh, then ate it. Uh, and um, uh, I don't know whether another another jocular remark uh, is that we, as we were eating it, we looked at each other with uh, shit eating grins, uh, <laughs> but we ate it and it wasn't at all bad. Um, you know, I would say that if I had to pick between a dish of ptarmigan shit and something, whatever it is that McDonald's puts between its buns, I would pick ptarmigan shit every time. Well, the most, uh, the, the best part of that story is that you, you carefully considered what you should drink with this meal. Yes, we, we carefully considered an appropriate drink. And there is an Icelandic uh, schnapps called Berke, which has several birch twigs in it. And it seemed to us appropriate, given that uh, there would have been birch catkins in the ptarmigan and coming out uh, with its droppings, that it would be a, an appropriate compliment uh, to the ptarmigan shit. And so we have it. Um, and I must add that one of the highlights of that, um, Icelanders can be um, simultaneously laconic and highly amusing. A fisherman walked by uh, as we were eating this, and he, he looked at the frying pans and asked what we were eating. And my friend Lena said, Rilpeshitr, which means ptarmigan shit. He did not blink an eyelid. Uh, May I have some, he said. And we gave him some, and he took a taste and looked at it, tasted it. And his uh, single remark was, need some salt. <laughs> That's eating as close to the tree as possible here, I guess. I'm eating close to the tree and below the tree, and there's a tree in the bottle as well. Yes. I can verify the, I can verify the um, truth of that story, by the way, if anybody's doubting the, uh, the facts that were just related. I traveled to the north of Iceland, and I met the protagonists, including this fisherman who... Uh, he had a remarkable ability to appear. Whenever you cracked a bottle of something, the guy would just appear like a genie. So he also, we, bird droppings weren't on the menu at that point um, when I was there, thankfully. It's, um, we had a lovely soup with uh, narwhal blubber, which was quite nice. Uh, very high in vitamin C apparently. But okay, so before we delve into to the stories from the book, I wanna ask you about its structure before I forget. Because when we spoke last year, you told me you were writing a memoir and what, what changed and why did it sort of morph into what, what, focusing what, in your time in the North? Well, what changed was this, that I'd had so many experiences and I wanted to document them. And if I did that, uh, I would have written a volume of, uh, that would make uh, War and Peace uh, seem like a haiku. <laughs> uh, and um, I also would have needed to live uh, to be roughly the same age as Methuselah. As I was writing these pieces, that I had a thread and it kept snapping um, because I would be engaged in peace and I would think, well, how can I connect eating ptarmigan shit, for instance, in northern Iceland? with interviewing uh, an aged lady in the Glulik Nunavut. Uh, she didn't talk about eating that. Uh, and in the end, finally, I saw these, the book as a series of vignettes, short essays, feuilletons, uh, sketches, and so on. Um, and some of them, uh, I have been told, Although none of it wasn't intentional, intentional, border on being prose poems. Hmm. It's it's a very nice book to dip in and out of the, for that reason. You know, it's a, yeah. the stories are are compact quite often. They're very funny, and uh, yeah, the, the the time passes remarkably fast. I read it on a flight back from Canada just recently. Um, yeah. So okay, so the book is divided into several sections. Like you've got your encounters with people, a section on flora, fauna, and food and one on remote places. And there are some really memorable people here. So we open with your first trip to the North, which Tom referenced, the fishing trip in Northern Ontario, where your Cree guide catches fish by talking to them, 
by whistling into their mouths and by talking to the lake. Now, like people in my hometown talk to fish all the time, but for a young man from the South, it must've been quite a, quite a shocking thing to see. Like, what did you make of this? Uh, what I made of it was this. I had what's called an epiphany. Uh, you know, he would talk to the fish, and but he would also look at the lake in a kind of intimate way. I mean, almost as if he were communicating with it in uh, lake ease. And then, you know, he'd gaze around wondrously at the surrounding taiga, too. And I was captivated by this. It was very different from uh, my own background. And I asked him out of uh, hearing of my parents whether I could come with him and learn the ways of the Cree. And he uh, said, no, but come to our camp and we'll serve you lunch. And I will mention the lunch only in connection with the tarmac ship because traditional foods play a part in this book. And what I, what I feel is that food is a sort of language. If you don't speak the words of the people you're with, uh, the group of people, uh, well, food and your eating of their food can provide a connectedness to them. Uh, and it will open up uh, facial expressions, gestures, and so on that previously had been kept captive. So. I would, and when I learned, for instance, languages like Inuktitut, almost some of the first words I learned, learned were words for foods. Mm -hmm. And I invariably was willing to eat uh, any food that uh, people from down south would have barfed at. Uh, and the only food, and I describe this in the book, the only food, the only native food, and they ranged from warble fly larvae uh, to, um, you know, the, the half digested clams in a walrus stomach and so on. The only food that I could not bear to eat, uh, raw seal eyes. Mm. How, would, how would you feel about raw seal eyes? If, you know, there, it's not just, it's the whole, it's not just what you see, the eye, the retina, but the, the whole uh, structure, uh, with the, uh, you know, the threads and bands and such like peering at you. Would you have, have you ever eaten cooked seal, uh, seal cooked sheep's eyes or anything like that? Anything, anything to do with eyes, I have an absolute horror of. I, I, can't, I can't even watch anybody put eye drops in, like nothing. So there's no, there's absolutely no chance that I would eat an eye. I'll eat a lot of other things, but. Yeah. Uh, Same here. No, I had to, you know, the, the, you know, the fellow, and it had to be raw, it couldn't be cooked. And he said, think of it as the yolk of an egg. This was an, <laughs> that it, doesn't it was really help. Fellow, and uh, as I wrote the essay, uh, what am I going to do? Uh, if I refuse to eat this, it will be, I will be casting aspersions on this culture. Fortunately, the knock at the door, there was a postman. I thrust it into my rucksack. He came back and I licked my lips and said, oh, that's really a tasty isi, which means sila. And he smiled. Later, I looked in my rucksack and found that it was covered with the goo of a seal eye, both my camera, the lens, and the notebook, but oh, especially the notebook. And that inspired me to write the essay that's in the book. Hmm. So the, the foods in, in these northern regions, how varied are they from place to place? Well, they're, they're <laughs> how should I put it? They're almost always some fish or meat. They're not a whole lot of veggies. Um, I had a friend who came up to visit uh, a northern Cree village who was a vegan. Oh, God. Uh, and um, the fact that she survived was utterly remarkable. They went out and tried to find things for her. And um, I'm trying to think it was, and they faked some things too. There were um, uh, cooked sucker fish that were passed off, I think, as rice, but I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, the ferret foods vary, but increasingly, uh, as the world goes down the drain, 
drain pipe of globalization, more and more foods from down south are taking over. And the native foods, the foods that are so connected because they've been looked at, they've been hunted. The animal, you know, in order to, to eat the food, one has to have an intimate knowledge of a landscape that the animal uh, which innards you're eating inhabits. And uh, when you go to uh, a supermarket, that experience doesn't occur. Mm. Uh, and increasingly, more and more supermarkets, more and more uh, uh, fatty foods from down south, more and more obesity, and more and more diabetes among northern natives. I guess that's why food is such a key to a culture as well. Like not just the eating of it and the sharing of it with people, but each dish that they serve has this intimate connection to the land. Oh. You know, the, the traditions of having hunted for the food, the, the methods of hunting, the time of year that you hunt it in, your mm -hmm. your experience and uh, moving through the landscape, you know, the knowledge of the territories where these foods come from. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the title essay last week of their concerns uh, uh perhaps the last man in the North or anywhere else who could speak the language of bears. He was an Inu elder from Labrador. And um, I didn't get to meet him for uh, reasons that uh, buyers of the book would discover. But what my host kept telling me was, you speak to the bear and ask its permission to kill you. Um, you have a connection with it. You ask it uh, permission and it says, yes, I will. But if you don't ask it, and ask it can be, consider ask it can be considered a metaphor that uh, implies a kind of strong connection uh, to the land that it has. But if you don't ask it, it will, but kill it, kill it anyway. Um, hmm. Uh, it will, its spirit, shut up, uh, its spirit will go off and, uh, I don't know what's going on here, it's a phone call. Please move a message Um, its spirit will tell other bears that human beings are not worth giving themselves to. And I asked the man who was my interviewer, hey, Bear was dead. Uh, how could it this happen? And he said, "Oh, only it's fleshy, and its spirit was still very alive." Hmm. And, and, that, and you, go ahead. You said that uh, you asked the guy, you know, when the last speaker died, you know, what what happens now? You know, people don't talk to bears anymore. Yeah. So, what, what does this mean for their hunting? Well, what it means for their hunting. Um, is there probably will be less respect for the bears and more runaway shooting rather than, and, and you know, a lot of people from down south, when they think of hunters, they think of rampaging individuals who shoot everything they see uh, and maybe eat a few bites. Whereas traditional hunters up north, it's very different. They know that if they kill too many of a certain critter, uh, they won't have enough food. So in terms of speaking the language of bears, it really, it says something uh, about how one has to behave with the creatures you're hunting and eating. Um, and this is the fact that the speaker has died, um, suggested to me uh, and that no one else speaks the language. I, I indicated it suggests a dead language now, but it also, um, uh, John Muir said, when you look at the world, you find that everything is hitched to everything else. So in addition to a dead language, it shows, it shows a change connection with habitats, with wildlife and with the world around them. Hmm. It's not just, oh, you know, no more grunt and make these noises to bears. You know, so what? It's a lot more than that. It has to do with the uh, um, 
cultural attitude that probably goes back millennia. So how much of that change goes in, in both directions? Like I've often encountered a sort of a misperception about traditional societies. Um, they're sort of seen as representatives of an ancient world that's dying out or slowly, slowly dying as modernity encroaches. But at the same time, these are remarkably adaptable people who rely on traditional ways of life that have sort of proven themselves through the centuries, but who also uh, make use of new technologies in, in unique and interesting ways that that fit with their environments. So, I mean, how much, how much of the change is, uh, I, the reason I ask that is it reminds me of a story from your book. Um, the, the story of the uh, elderly Greenlander who fixed the helicopter. That That's remarkable. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could tell that actually that's well, yeah, never heard well, anything like that. Well, what happened was that this, um, uh, helicopter with the Danish pilot landed in uh, a remote village in Greenland and it landed with some difficulty. And then, the, a pilot couldn't get, he played around with the engine, played around with it, nothing, nothing. He couldn't fix it. And uh, uh, an elderly Greenlander, who may well have been born, nah, I'm not sure pre-contact, but certainly very traditional. Um, he said, may I have a look at it in Danish? And uh, the pilot thought, what the hell? Uh, you can't do any worse than it's already I mean worse with it. And the fellow played around with it and then said in the Danish equivalent, all fixed now. Now I talked to this chap afterwards, and he had done a little bit of fixing of uh, uh, you know engines affixed to motorboats. But they are very different. Apples and oranges, you could call them, uh, uh, between that. And he was just using his, his, I mean, it goes beyond rationality. Uh, it includes intuition and survival skills. Uh, and I asked him, how, how did you manage to do that? I mean, personally, uh, if someone had pointed a firearm at my head and said, fix this, and let's say it hadn't been a helicopter, it had been maybe even a vacuum cleaner, I wouldn't be alive now to be chatting with you. But what he did was he pointed to his head and went like this. Thought, uh, in a world where traditionally everything relates to one survival, your mind goes into certain areas that someone's mind, if the person is living in downtown LA, doesn't go into. Uh, and that is how he fixed this. You know, that explains how he fixed it. Uh, mm. He was looking at it within a traditional sense, uh, a traditional way and a broad perspective. Mm. Yeah, there, you said something. I think that you quoted him as saying, if you don't know how to improvise, you can't survive or yeah. you don't survive. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So. Yeah, it's interesting this too this brings up sort of the the worldview of the of the people you're traveling among um you say that he he went to a different place to inhabit the perhaps the mind of somebody who knew how to fix a helicopter or, or a mind where this uh these these secrets might be uh, revealed to him uh, the other uh, thing i find interesting about that is sort of the way the many layers of worlds permeate their lives at all times like dreams for example uh, there was an interesting story in the book involving um, an elder in Labrador, I think it was, who yes. who walked up to you in the street and said, uh, last night I dreamed I would meet you. I dreamed you'd be coming to my house today. And you write that custom required him to invite you into his home, even if he hated your guts, uh, because yeah, in a sense, know. the dream demanded it. The dream demanded it. Yeah, um, so, so what is the importance of dreams in these Well, cultures? in that case, you know, dreams, dreams uh, and the telling of them Telling mm. such a mm. key word, and it's words seemingly dying out. Um, you know, I um, am a former prisoner of war of a series of academic institutions, uh, but I graduated by spending time in areas where oral knowledge was the most important form. Talking, telling stories, connecting with a person, and uh, that connection is not 
uh, is very different from walking down the street today um, uh, in the morphological stance, both of today and the future with the cell phone affixed to one's ear. Uh, and I saw how communication could really matter um, and how it, it sort of provided a window on the world that I hadn't previously seen. Um, it also showed a connectivity between one person and another. In academic classrooms, um, there would be four walls and a person in front, and individuals either bent over and taking notes or staring out the window in the forlorn hope that the class would be over in a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I might also mention that most not all, but most of the people I discuss in this book are of advanced years. Mm. Um, they're bearers of tradition. And there are a few exceptions, but I strongly feel about the, help, the, the importance of traditional life and the fact that it's disappearing with all sorts of things. You now go to certain villages and um, you see something being declared, not vocally, but it's declared, my satellite dish is bigger than your satellite dish. Hmm. And that means they're connecting with uh, only different areas uh, down south and so on, and looking at prime time TV, uh, uh, they're also um, very, very eager computer users. Hmm. I once had, well, uh, we'll get to this in a second. Uh, I have to admit that with respect to commute computers, uh, I, um, how should I put it? Um, uh, when I approach one, the hairs grow up on the back of my neck, but... <laughs> The hairs go up on the back of the computer's neck too. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And, you have a very uh, uneasy relationship with technology. Yes, it's yes. a very uneasy relationship. Yeah, I don't know how you survived the Cretaceous extension, to be honest. I'm one of the few, one of the very few to survive the Cretaceous extinction. Uh, me and and a few small mammals, uh, <laughs> just us. But at any rate, uh, what I've noticed is how. And the the learning that the gentleman in Greenland, the way he resolved this issue with the helicopter, uh, it has been quite easy for younger Native people uh, to segue to computers, et cetera. Uh, mm. you know, hardly anyone, I mean, when I first started going north there, the old, um, uh, there weren't any computers. And slowly but surely there were, they were there. And I saw people using them and, st and spending more and more time in solitary confinement. Hmm. I did have well, about 20 years ago, maybe 18, an iPad, which went awry. And uh, when something like that happens, I think, okay, I'll walk away from it and then it'll recover my absence will help. And I did, and it didn't, but uh, a young Inuit lady uh, saw that I was having problems and uh, she did just as good a job at fixing my iPad as the Greenlandic elder did in fixing the helicopter. Hmm. So do you think, do people seem to have an innate sense of how these things work and the, you know, this guy did with the helicopter? they almost seem to have an innate sense. Hmm. Uh, and it could well be that they're translating their survival skills uh, from hunting and traveling on the land hmm. to digital technology. Hmm. And indeed, in a lot of the remote com com communities, uh, people want to connect with each other and they can't unless they have community computers connect with somebody next door try to call out for a emergency helicopter to come uh you know i'm sorry i'm i'm suffering from uh 
I, I transform myself into a bear. Uh, will your hospital look after me? And there are any number of instances where um, uh, I talk to people who would tell me, oh, my mother was a caribou. On the outside, a person, but inner, inner self, caribou. Hmm. No big deal. Indeed, it meant a kind of uh, harmony with hmm. the world around one. Hmm. Well, this, this sort of obsession with um, stories, the telling of stories and the collecting of stories is such a key element in your work, all the way back to like your early travels in Ireland, even yeah, yeah. right through, uh, it's, it seems to have been always present for you. And I, I find the, um, uh, a lot of your stories, it's sort of a combination of uh, collecting stories from these older people and collecting traditional stories and your own bumbling in a sense that opens the door. So like, that's one of the things I like about uh, your writing is the way sort of your own travel mishaps end up uncovering deep mysteries. So like the, there's a story in the book about some, um, a time in Greenland where you, where you smeared glue all over your face, thinking it was bug repellents. And yeah. then by way of this, uh, <laughs> this mishap, you learned uh, the story of why mosquitoes prefer to eat uh, or feast on humans. That's exactly right. No, we, if, if any trip, uh, that is without travails. Uh, I, I can't imagine it as being successful. Tra travails make mean stories. Mm. Um, and uh, I was um, horrified a few years ago, there was a, a cruise ship called the Crystal Serenity that was mm. like 13 stories that managed to travel the Northwest Passage without a single travail. Actually, I mentioned that in one of the stories, the cruise ship story in the book, which was fraught with travails. Um, we couldn't land, the ice was on the shore, uh, winds, etc. And I believe we didn't manage to make it to a single destination. This was going up the coast of Labrador uh, that was in the plan uh, because it was. And the passengers, bless them, accepted this. They mm -hmm. said, this is adventure. This is called an adventure cruise. And if everything went neatly, uh, it wouldn't be an adventure at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they supported it. Uh, but with respect to this in, in Northwest Passage, I, I don't think I'm being romantic and thinking back on the past and what happened for uh, that poor flabby individual, Sir John Franklin mm -hmm. uh, and others. Uh, I'm thinking of a uh, remote landscape uh, that hasn't dedicated itself to human activity. And uh, human activity should be have perils and mistakes and broken bones and such like. And a 13-story cruise, cruise ship that goes from Seattle to New York City via the Northwest Passage, um, this strikes me as a disaster. Well, it's, it's inviting a trip fraught with peril for sure. Because I mean, if they keep sending thirteen-story cruise ships through there, uh, oh, how yes. long before one of them, one of them crashes into something or sinks? And could you imagine, like these communities can't host uh, basically a small city of survivors? I mean, like, what's going to happen to these people? It's just a disaster right. waiting to happen. Let alone the, the fuel spills and and the environmental degradation of such a trip. Exactly. I I quote in my one of my previous books. Uh, Goodbye Ice. I mentioned that mm. cruise ship. And I meant and I semi-quote the line by Yates. And I say, what rough beast, what rough, what rough beast is thought you not toward Bethlehem, but toward Cambridge Bay, which mm. is one of the communities that you're talking yeah. about. Uh. Yeah, it's an awful development. But I, I don't want to get too far off track here. I want to go back to stories. Before I forget, um, I wanted to ask you about you know, the books and collections. Uh, you've you've published several books that bring together and collect traditional stories from uh, from Greenland and other places. Why and what do you think they contain for today's readers? Well, I mean, I, it's it's understandable what these what these stories mean to the people in those places. But why should somebody from from the south, for example, read them? Yes. Well, I, I'll start out with answering your first question: uh, Why? Hmm. Because I saw them dying out. I saw that they were 
on the verge of extinction. And in the same way uh, that if there were certain uh, plants, animals, birds that were threatened, I would want to do whatever I could to mm -hmm. save them. And so in collecting stories, and there were any number of places where I would go and individuals would say, You're, this happened in, in uh, Shishishi, Labrador, another Indian community. You're the first person I remember who's come here with an outsider with an interest in our stories. Wow. But given the nature of the world and the fact that storytelling uh, is becoming itself an extinct species, I perpetually felt the need to preserve it in some way. And even if that way is on paper. And when I lived in Ireland, more than one person would tell me, I would record the story, they, they knew I would be putting it in a book. They'd say, you kill a story by putting it on paper. Mm -hmm. What that means is the direct facial contact, you know, the, maybe the five and country senses, as Dylan mm -hmm. Thomas would say. And one of the senses could be that your um, uh, storyteller hasn't taken a bath in 15 months, uh, and that would, that's one of the senses that would be alerted. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I feel strongly that things that are endangered should be preserved somehow. Um, and one of the things that's happened is with respect to stories, I made a point of having respected the books sending the books to the communities where I collected the stories. Mm. And uh, I uh, once got, um, well, this was an email from uh, uh, Inuk in Iglulik. Uh, he was a kid of about 23. And he said, and this, this caused the uh, cockles of my heart, the, those otherwise frozen mollusks, uh, to warm. He hmm. said, the stories in your book are even better than Stephen King's. <laughs> um, hmm. So whether he recognized some of them as being from uh, his ancestors, I'm not sure. Hmm. These stories are so important because they contain an entire world, you know? Yeah. They contain entire worldviews and, and ways of seeing that, that we're in danger of losing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They form they're, they're a paradigm of all sorts of things, including entertainment. Mm. Um, but one invariably, I would have people tell me, you know, and, and let's say starvation is right around the bend, or there's no there's no food around, or people are somehow irritated by cold weather. Telling stories is a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, it gets people to focus less and less to take a, a bigger a view that sees a whole picture and maybe their mind is liberated in a way that instead of anxiety laughter and a lot of the traditional stories laughter is one of the world's best medicines mm -hmm. um, and by the way I mentioned this uh, in the final the uh, final piece here, mm. I'm describing in Greenland, windy day, the tent yeah. uh, is wobbling back and forth. You remember this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read uh, that if you can. That's, that's a really good story. Well, yeah. Okay. I will read that. It's, it's a short one. Um, well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read the latter part. Mm. Uh, and, you know, Greenlanders cannot survive without at least three cups of coffee per sitting, um, and I can manage with only two. So he comes and, and I serve him, we're having coffee and I give him a freeze-dried package of beef stroganoff. And he looked at the bag and I said, oh, you can have some of it uh, if you want. But and then he immediately put some of the powder in his mouth and grimaced. American food, no good, he said. 
We sat in the tent to escape the wind, but we could hardly hear each other talking because it was almost as noisy inside as it was outside, thanks to the wind. And then a powerful blast brought down the tent's heavy white canvas on top of us. I cursed mightily, but the Greenlander laughed and laughed some more. A time honored method among Northern indigenous people for dealing with circumstances considerably more serious than a fallen tent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this really comes across in all the stories you've collected from these regions too. This uh, just how cheerful and how funny these people are. You know, yeah. such a remarkably um, open view of the world. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose it's you. You basically have to be if you're living in such harsh conditions. You know, your your tents have, tents blown away and yeah. You, you, it's a it's a survival question. You either um, deal with it uh, in what shall we say a mode of whimsy and laughter, or get tangled into a knot of anxiety that makes the situation still worse. Hmm. And that's why I said at the end of that story that uh, some of the elders I met um, in the story. Uh, COVID, let's say COVID had come around, um, given their attitude toward difficult circumstances, uh, what they might have done was laugh. And mm. by doing so, they would have boosted their immune systems mm. and maybe indeed triumphed over the disease. Because as I said, it's, it's actually the last sentence in the book. Hmm. laughter is the best medicine hmm. and this idea of stories as um, tools of survival it comes uh, up in a lot of your work as well like the, i want to quote a bit from at the end of the world where you wrote part of our survival as a species may have come from listening to stories which entered our neural pathways and provided us with passed on lore as well as passed on entertainment so the idea that the, the telling of stories kind of alters alters the circuitry of your brain and the way you see the oh, world is really interesting. Yeah, it does indeed. Um, and so how, how do you think technology is changing that? I mean, because we, we, like, you can navigate the world through through a series of directions or a series of directions embedded in a story, for example, uh, that will guide you across the landscape. Or you can look at this at this phone and, you know, hand your mind over to to Google Maps and passively follow directions. I mean, do you see this eroding in, in oh, younger yeah, people, for example? I, 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 like a GPS, uh, I never use a GPS hmm. because if I do, my memory will suffer the consequences. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, any number of instances now of younger people in Greenland and other places which they could not get a signal. And because they didn't have an experience traversing wherever it was they were, uh, did not know what to do. And some of them ended up dying. Um, mm. Somebody, a couple of places, not so long ago, someone uh, stuck frozen, 20 some year old uh, chap on a skidoo in East Greenland mm. with his eye device in his frozen hand. Jesus. No mm. signal. What I like uh, is um, I want to look at the world around me and the plants, the fungi, the great glacial erratics in the sky will tell me where I am. Hmm. This is what happens when you try to navigate with one of these devices, right? Like you're just staring at this. You're not looking at the landscape around you. Right. You're, you're, not, you're not really in it. You're in it in a sense, but on paper, like you're in a paper interpretation of it. That's exactly so right. It, you just give your brain away to something else. I mean, it's, it's becoming it's, it's, global. It's, it's, yeah, it's gotten, to the, gotten to the point where you just blindly punch this thing into the, to the car navigation system and follow it rather than, you know, have to think about you think about your route ahead of time. I know roughly how to get there. I might need some fine tuning for these, you know, narrow European village streets or something. But when you have that generalized sense of the landscape, then you you know if you're going wrong. You you have a sense of that this thing is leading you astray. But you know, yeah, without that, but it's what you're doing is following a straight and narrow path rather than mm. 
winding and perfect path. And with the winding and perfect path, you make so many more interesting discoveries. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and these... yeah, yeah, in the tundra, um, you know, I, I have this tendency to get lost. Um, and when I get lost, I'm eventually found. But uh, in, in route of having made a false turn, I found all sorts of interesting things. There's a wonderful quote, um, and I don't know where it originated, uh, but it is sunk in my head forevermore. Every disadvantage is really an advantage. Mm. And even, you know, getting on the wrong street in Berlin as you're trying to navigate your way towards a bookstore uh, or um, the home of the concubine, uh, you uh, you might make the wrong turn, but what interesting things you might discover on the wrong turn. Um, and because you don't know where you are, you're looking, you're viewing, you're observing a whole lot more than if you're going the same way each time. Mm. And this is why you get lost all the time because you're a writer, you know, and it, nothing good ever happens to you from being found, you know. That's exactly stuff. That's exactly getting true. lost is more interesting. Well, you mentioned too, when you're walking through the landscape, looking at mushrooms, I learned a couple of interesting things from, from reading this book. You wrote that mushrooms require more calories to digest than they contain. So it's a good idea to eat fatty foods with them. I didn't know that. Yes. And that's, that's very true. And it's one reason why virtually no Northern native people eat mushrooms. Hmm. Uh, and also, you know, the knowledge is, uh, come to us, well, we theorize, oh, the reason they don't eat mushrooms is that long a time, long time ago, somebody or several people died from eating mushrooms, and the shaman said, don't eat mushrooms. Hmm. It's not true. It has more to do with the diet than hmm. anything else. And uh, you need some fatty foods. There's something called rabbit starvation. Hmm. Yes, yeah. Uh, where you know, if you only, only eat rabbits, uh, which have lean meat, you're not likely to survive. And only fish, uh, you know about the Hubbard Wallace expedition in Labrador. Mm. Uh, they, they thought, oh, we've got a big fish net. Um, uh, we can survive on fish. Well, winter was coming on and they had hundreds of fish. Um, but slowly but surely, they started. Uh, and if the native people have uh, names for mushrooms that uh, will remind them, don't eat it. Like mm. in uh, northern Alaska, devil's ears. Mm. Um, the Koyukon in Alaska, mushroom, the word for mushroom translates as mouse food. Mm. Uh, and in the uh, northern Labrador, it, the word argyagna, I think it is, translates hmm. as that which you shouldn't eat. Hmm. That's really interesting. So this is why they, they eat a mix of um, fats and meats quite yes, often? quite often. And you then know, I suppose that... Yeah, and why the fats of uh, uh, whale fat, uh, hmm. walrus fat, seal fat, uh, all essential dietary ingredients. Hmm. I was just and reading they, that they're remarkably high in vitamin C as well. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. The raw fats and the, with the raw seal liver as well. Raw seal liver. Oh, by the way, I have to use, I thought you were going to ask me about languages. I, there were, hmm. I, I mentioned uh, that, you know, a lot of the uh, words I first learned, especially in Inuit dialects, uh, um, pertain to food. And, you know, I, this is one of the first phrases I, and I could walk up to somebody and utter this, utter this, they would smile and often I would be invited as a guest into their home and be served it. Puisip mamak, which means I like raw seal liver. Mm. How, how does it taste? How would you describe it? Oh, it, it tastes much better. It, it often is eaten after the seal is hunted and mm. after the gallbladder is removed, the seal is hunted, killed, pulled onto the boat. Uh, gallbladder is very gently removed to do, mm. not do any spillage. And then mm. the seal liver, which is steaming with warmth, uh, they have just 
uh, being removed from a, a living creature, um, eaten raw. Mm. And I have to say, it's hard to say how it tastes, except my own feeling is it's the best liver I've ever eaten. Mm. That's interesting. Absolutely yeah. superb. You should try it sometime. I don't suppose raw sea liver is available in where you live. <laughs> no, no, there's not a lot of seals around here, but I, I had raw liver in Japan. Uh, oh, really? Once. Yeah. From, it, from what animal? Cow? I think it was a cow, yeah. yeah. It, it wasn't clear at this point. This was on a drinking expedition, so oh. things had gone badly awry by that point, but uh, I was working at an English school, and my my boss would take us out you know, on payday to his local uh, izakaya, this small village bar where he had his own bottle on the wall with his name on it and on a shelf. And he somehow took it into his head to order us raw liver because he thought, you know, it's good for your good for your libido. <laughs> so we had to we had to consume the whole plate. Yeah. The texture was rather alarming, but uh, I don't yeah. remember the taste very much. Yeah. Do you know a Japanese magazine called The Monkey? No, no. It's a very popular magazine. And the editor happened upon my book of Inuit Folk Tales and is they're being translated into Japanese and really they're going over very well in Japan. Uh, And I see this really as, um, I don't think I'm exaggerating too much. It's a very strong connection, ancient connection between Mm. certain Asian cultures and certain indigenous ones in the Arctic. Uh, Mm what we call, and it's not meant to be, it's never used in an insulting way, Eskimoan languages hmm. and cultures. Hmm. Yeah, there seems to be a similar reverence for the land, in a sense. I think the, um, the sense that the, uh, the spirits are everywhere and uh, natural things have kind of a, a soul or a kami. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the world of the Inuit, until the missionaries came, Everything possessed the soul. Hmm. Drift logs, animals, stones, and even anak, which means hmm. shit. Hmm. They all had a soul. And then the missionaries came and said, you're bloody wrong. Only human beings have a soul. Hmm. And that changed the Veltan Shum. Yes. Uh, hmm. So you mentioned... Uh, monkeys the monkey magazine but uh, and and other animals that's yeah. something else i wanted to mention uh, you also had some interesting encounters with animals some of which are in, are recounted in this book like i've been menaced by everything from angry bison to um, a troop of baboons i fought off once and uh, oversized insects but your grizzly encounter trumps all of those so maybe you could tell us about the time you frightened off a mother grizzly and her cubs by flashing your genitals at them well, what happened was this. Uh, I was, it was a white grizzly, which is a rare color variation in the north of the brown grizzly. There are no more than 100 or 150 of them in existence. Uh, this was in the uh, Kootenay area of British Columbia. And I was with this photographer and we were wandering around trying to find some. Uh, and uh, striking out completely. And on the last day, I got up at about 5 a.m. and went to answer nature's call. And as I was doing so, realized that I was standing between a mother white grizzly and her two cubs. I thought, now what the blazes did the book say about this? You know, do you uh, continue answering the call and as if nothing's going on? Do you back up while answering the call? Do you stop answering the call? and run. Well, what happened before I could do that, the mother grizzly got up on uh, her hind legs to stare at me and uh, suddenly got down and ran off, ran away from her cubs. Such what she saw was that terrifying. Uh, And they ran around me and followed her up the hillside. And a part of this is the fact that you know it's a good idea, and native people do this too. If you want to keep your your campsite uh, free from not just bear attacks but other animals, hmm. urinate in a circle around it, and that helps enormously. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, absolutely, and traditional hunters uh, would do that. But hmm. I went back to my photographer and told him about this, and he couldn't get his equipment ready in time. But he said. You have an opportunity to make a fortune. I said, what do you mean? You're a virile member. 
better than makes better than a, a, a rifle you know marketed and uh to this day i have not done so you've missed so many opportunities to monetize your experiences here yes i do uh but uh in any event it was um, an extraordinary experience i did get to see this rare critter although mm. once again i don't know if you would call this a mistake i was sort of uh, two-thirds asleep when indeed what i should have been is three-quarters awake mm. and i probably would but had i not made this mistake i probably wouldn't have had the interaction with the white grizzlies mm. That's really interesting about pissing around the perimeter of your campsite. I didn't yes. know that. I've traveled in grizzly country before, and I mean, we took the usual, you know, cooking at a distance, and leave, we left our clothes behind where we cooked, and not to carry any food smells back to the tent. But uh, I wish I would have known that at the time. It works with polar bears. It works with grizzlies. I'm not 100 percent certain it works with black bears. Hmm. Uh, polar bears as well. Huh? Oh yes, yes. Hmm. Uh, what this does, it marks a territory the way they would mark the territory. And you know, any number of critters, not just bears, do use their urine as well as their fecal matter to mm. mark their habitat, mm. which partly says, that marking partly says, stay away, you bugger. Mm. Oh, have you had any encounters with polar bears? Many. Mm. Um, but none of them have... Um, I, I once had a... Um, uh, it's on an island, Mansell Island in uh, Hudson Bay. Hmm. And uh, we put all our food in in a um, up, up in a cache hmm. so the bear couldn't get it. But I had a, a bag of cliff bars. Um, and I didn't I thought, well, oh, this isn't going to appeal. So I came back one day and there were the camp, uh, the tent had been entered, the bag was missing. And there were ball, paw prints inside the tent. I went right, and for the next several days, I would see piles of polar bear shit with cliff bar wrappers <laughs> ensconced in them. Uh, oh and the the, the uh, end of the story is I started, I took pictures of them and sent them to cliff bars. And I said, you can use these photos to market. Uh, yeah. it, Polar bears even are interested in your product. How about giving me a lifetime supply? Uh, they, they did not give in, but they gave me a, a annual supply, a year supply of polar wow. bears in return for my uh, revelation. Yeah, I mean, I can understand how a man who likes to eat bird droppings would think that a, a photo of you know <laughs> polar bear droppings with cliff bars embedded in it might be a, an appealing marketing strategy, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, it was it, truth to tell. I, I did it more or less as a joke, uh, um, but thought that uh, I might get something in return, and I did. They're pretty good, actually. I was sponsored by them once for a trip as well. Oh, and really? We ate, them, yeah, we ate them multiple times a day. They gave us like the the oatmeal raisin ones mostly, but then oh, yeah. the peanut butter ones. Yeah. So we we packed our uh, our supplies so that we would get like a peanut butter one every three days or something. It was quite a treat. Oh, how very nice! But I never got tired of them. I never get tired of them either. Yeah, they're surprisingly good. They're good. I have. Uh, it, it, they tend to be my breakfast. Mm. Uh, that and coffee. Uh, yeah. I'm totally filled up while I'm doing my writing, which is mainly in the morning. Yeah, so the same uh, for me. I, I just drink, have a coffee in the morning. No food yeah. until like noon, one yeah, maybe. Yeah. No, and I also had in in uh, forgotten where it was. It was in Grizzly. No, Kodiak Island. I was on a high ridge. Hmm. I was walking along, and you know, one could argue, yes, well, one has to be on alert for bears. But I seem to be more scary to bears than they are to me because I saw <laughs> this this bear. Actually, it wasn't Kodiak. It was in it was another place in Alaska. It was a, a brown grizzly. Hmm. Uh, it looked at me, and the way the grizzly's paws are arranged, the range for climbing, hmm. but not descending. Well, hmm. this bear made a mistake. It was so terrified by the sight of yours truly. But it went downhill and it, it quickly started rolling and it ended up in a kind of, uh, just, we're talking 20, 25 feet uh, on its back down below. It slowly got up to its feet and there was a look of, I think, total embarrassment on its face. 
And it all sort of then looked up at me and said, please don't tell anyone about this. <laughs> and then you proceeded to write it down and now you're telling everybody. I am indeed. So, so you dropped a couple of interesting place names there. Like you've been to more remote places in the North than anyone else I know. Uh, what would you say was the most memorable and why? What was your favorite? Well, my favorite several, uh, Wrangell Island in Siberia mm. and Jan Mayen, north mm. of Iceland. And what I like about both places is they consist primarily of nature, not people. Mm. Um, uh, Wrangell Island only has a few year-round residents and their park rangers. It's a mm. world heritage site. And Jan Mayen has a uh, Norwegian weather station and a few mm -hmm. people in the weather station. But most of the, in the island, including me, it's at the very northern top tip of the North Atlantic Ridge. So it's mm -hmm. volcanic. Mm -hmm. You go down the ridge down to um, Tristan da Cunha. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. ridge, but this is the northern top. And there's a, uh, a huge 7,450 foot. So th this is Jan Mayen, right? Jan Mayen. Yeah. Rising directly out of the sea. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, Wow. erupting or spewing uh, sometime now 1500 years ago uh, when uh, the famous Irish navigator St. Brendan was sailing by and he determined that what was going on at the summit there were a whole bunch of overactive blacksmiths on the summit. And that's what was causing all this smoke. It's, it's a, a natural good, assumption to make. I mean, especially if you're Irish and Blacksmith mm. is an important part of your life. Why wouldn't they be there? Sure. Yeah. So, so there's an active weather station there. Is there, isn't there some ruined buildings as well? I'm sure I've seen. I, what I was looking for was Atlantic City. And mm. uh, I told the reader that um, I was heading toward Atlantic City, but uh, you know, perhaps in their heads, I thought, is he actually going to go from this remote island to near New Jersey? But it was, in fact, an American weather station during the Second World War. Now, totally abandoned, ruined buildings, uh, a ruined sauna, sort of a barracks that has collapsed. Mm -hmm. and that was my destination. I didn't quite make it, uh, as the story says. But then what I say is, well, no matter. It's the journey, not the destination that matters. Hmm. Is this the place where all the driftwood washes up? Yes, it is the place where all the driftwood from Siberia washes yeah. up. And it goes around, and it's, some of it is aging, like 300, 400 years old. And, um, you know, it goes around the northern gyres and it hits the East Greenland current. Down it goes and washes on the beach. And a number of um, local people traditionally use the wood from the driftwood in hmm. their huts. Hmm. So how would you get to this place? I, I mean, well, it's not an easy place to reach. It's huh? not easy. I, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in Iceland, as you know, and, and I had a fisherman who was heading up in that direction hmm. to go fishing. And I have to admit that my... Uh, Trip there was somewhat illegal. You're supposed to get permission from what's called a Sisselman in Norway to go there. Um, but it, it was the second time I've been there. I was first mm. there on a cruise ship when I lectured. Mm. And some people can go if they have permission or a scientific contract, they can mm. go and camp there. Um, and I have a friend who studied the mushrooms in the Almaya and camped there. Hmm. But uh, my visit was more illegal. A fisherman dropped me off and said, with luck, I'll pick you up in eight hours, but who knows what the weather would be like. And uh, I didn't have a tent, and there wasn't any enclosure. Hmm. So my fingers were crossed. I, I prayed to my god, Raven, um, the uh, ancient uh, northern god who created the world, Raven. Uh, but uh, please keep this uh, in such a the weather in such a condition that I won't be stranded here. And um, uh, but then I also thought, well, there are worse places I could leave my bones. Hmm. Well, I guess the blacksmiths would have looked after you anyway. 
Yeah, the blacksmiths might not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if they would consider me fodder for their uh, blacksmith. Uh, See, uh, Wrangell Island, that's um, north uh, towards the Alaska side of Siberia, right? What's yeah, the geography well, of that? What is the landscape like about, there? It was never glaciated. Mm. Um, and it's like the northern part of Yukon. And it was never glaciated. It uh, has a um, fairly rocky, tundra-like terrain. Mm. It has an extraordinary number of endemic plants, um, more so than any locale of its size in the north. And in fact, John Muir, who was one of the first people to set foot there, really, he went looking looking for uh, uh, the lost. Um, what was his name? The uh, chap who disappeared in Siberia, William, um, I forgot him, uh, but a lot of uh, search parties went after him. Hmm. But he found a rare plant in the mint family that was named after him. Hmm. But the geography is such that, and the soil is very rich, uh, less outlined than uh, many other. I have a bit of a grant to. Uh, document the fungi on mm. the island. I found several species that had never been documented before, uh, but I found another species very interesting. Um, and I, I mentioned it here, I believe. The northernmost, it turns out it's not. I was told by uh, a Russian who um, had um, admittedly uh, drunk a certain amount of vodka uh, without without which the person would not have been Russian, of course, uh, <laughs> that this was the northernmost outhouse in the world. And I have since found that there are several on Ellesmere Island that are farther north. Uh -huh. Even so, it was in a collapsed state. And, you know, I, I said at the end of the story, let's see if I can find it without too much difficulty, uh, because I, I praised its... Um, its um, what do they call it? It's perfume and uh, its nature uh, sort of in a, it was in a state of utter destruction. Um, it obviously had not been used in um, how many years? Well, let's see, I'm going to try to find this um, somewhere because I want to read read it, uh, the last paragraph. Um, but it had not been used in a long, long time. And this made it very attractive to me because it was part nature and part mm. human contraption. Mm. And um, it had um, legends. Now oh, the Hall House at the end of the world. So at any rate, here is the, here is the paragraph. Uh, I reached what turned out to be a lavatorial relic from Soviet times. <laughs> its wooden walls had mostly collapsed. Its floor was a mass of moss and its lichen-covered seat was not even a semicircle much less a circle. What remained was tilted precariously to the starboard. <laughs> Northernmost outhouse or not, it didn't seem to care about being listed in the Guinness Book of Records. To hell with celebrity, its ruinous state seemed to proclaim. My only wish is to become part of this remote bounteous Earth. Hmm. I suppose the same could be said of you. Your uh, wish would be to become part of this remote, bounteous Earth in some forgotten corner of the world. Uh, I think that's true. Um, well, I think we we have to wrap up, quite. I just realized you're, you've got a pun on your head. Is this like a mycological pun? You're wearing a, a mushroom cap. Yes, it's a fungi cap. It says fungi on it. Mm -hmm. And it's... Um, a magazine I write for called Fungi, mm -hmm. uh, to its I'm, uh, 
editorial person there, and uh, we we get caps sent to us periodically, um, and that's what I'm wearing. Mm. I was going to. I, I have typically, if I, what I was thinking of doing, I put on the wrong cap. There are one or two mushroom essays here, and I was thinking, well, with one cap, I'm a mycologist, and I was going to put this cap on, but it was already on, so I didn't do so. Shall we have? You have, to admit, you have to admit that was pretty funny, mushroom cap. And I'm not even a mycologist, and I can crack these jokes just like that. We have a. We actually have a question from Mr. Paul Spitzer here. He's asking, uh, Larry, is your nose pale from frostbite? Is my nose pale from frostbite? Well, tell Paul that it's much more common to get frostbite in these temperate realms than it is to get it in the Arctic. Mm. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. But um, as Casey Stengel would say, if he was alive today, you can Google it. <laughs> is that true? It's it? very true. My nose isn't red from uh, Paul. It's good. Uh, good to have you there. Uh, I appreciate your enthusiasm for my work and um, uh, the temperature outside here at Cambridge today was 55 degrees and I was, as I often do, walking in a t-shirt. Mm. Um, to me, 55 degrees, I can even, in Glasgow, I walked in a t-shirt in 50, 45 degrees because one's body is a furnish, furnace and you walk mm. faster, you create heat and uh, you don't need to put on uh, all sorts of expensive REI guard. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what those temperatures are in Canadian, but uh, I found it, you know, traveling in Iceland, the sweaters were, were much warmer than any of the uh, synthetic oh, modern gear that I had. Oh, yes, that's very true. Yeah, really good in the wet weather as well. But before I let you go, I, got, I wanted to ask you one more thing here. I didn't realize you had met Haldor Laxness. Oh, until yes. I had read this book. So for people who don't know Haldor Laxness, he was the, the Icelandic Nobel laureate. Um, if you're looking for a book, you should read Independent People, which is a Absolutely. remarkably funny book. I mean, you see these characters. You see them novel. everywhere in Iceland. Like a Anywhere you go, you see, you know, Bjartur of Summer Houses and, and these people all around you. It's, yeah. yeah, it's really amazing. So what was he like? What was he like? He was a charming individual in, in, in this meeting, and I met him numerous times um, when I lived in Iceland. I taught, um, sorry to use an obscenity, I taught at university, and uh, uh, he had a house in Reykjavik and a house outside, and I met him in both places. Mm -hmm. uh, and I met him, the first time I met him, I the first time I arrived in Iceland, and I didn't know anyone, I knew him. Imagine a Nobel Prize winner whose phone number was in the uh, uh, mm. telephone book. And I called him up and he invited me over for a visit and we smoked cigars, et cetera. But then we got to know each other over time. And this one time I visited him and his wife, Oyder, was there. And she said, oh, he's upstairs reading Proust. And uh, uh, I, I thought, okay, I'll wait. And he waited a while, came back down. I said, oh, you're reading Proust. Why? My publisher wants me to. Really? And I thought, why? You know, to, to inject an element of, you know, French uh, uh, stream of consciousness and or decadence into, you know, the wonderful Icelandic tomes you write. And um, what happened, however, though, was my our, our misunderstanding of each other's language was such that I misheard her and misheard him. The word was not Proust, but proofs. <laughs> yeah, I can understand why you'd have to read those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's a wonderful writer. And mm. I, in one of the visits, um, it's actually the one in the book, I say, you know, it's a pity you're not better known in America. And he looked at me with a scowl and said, way he raised finger, I am not Agatha Christie. <laughs> he certainly isn't. Yeah, wonderful writer. Yeah. Well, the time has uh, flown by, at least it has for me. And uh, any more questions, maybe? And yeah, any any uh, more questions from the uh, the audience there? I've I've mastered the Q and A. Mm. It says 10, uh, by the word chat, it says 10 right here. Huh? Where is that? No, that's Q&A, chat. Oh, no, chat's. Uh... Oh, yes, there's well, chat. chat is different. They don't yes. want to chat. It's no, no, chat is our host giving me the, 
giving me the signal to wrap things up. So hey. it seems that we must take a bow and close the curtain on this thoroughly entertaining conversation. Thank you so, so much, uh, Ryan. It, it's been not so much uh, a Q and A. Oh, how did you do? Where did you see this? Um, you know, how did you like Ross Eli? But in real life conversation, such that I totally appreciate your presence there. Yeah, well, it's always a pleasure to talk with you and uh, to read your stuff and then to hear these stories live as well. So um, thanks to, to you, Larry, for entertaining us for the past hour. And thank you to Trinity University Press for hosting this discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, don't forget, we've got a discount code for those of you who haven't got a copy yet of The Last Speaker of Bear. Uh, you go to tupress.org and use the promo code LSB20 at checkout for a generous 20% off. That's T-U-P-R-E-S-S dot O-R-G and use the promo code LSB20 on checkout. So thank you. That's it for me. Uh, thank, thank you, you and good night. Good night. Thanks, Ryan.